Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, and joining me today is new assistant coach for the Texas women's swim team, Mitch Dalton. Mitch, how are you doing today? What's up, Coleman? How are you doing? Let's do this. Before we get to Texas, I want to I want to hear a little bit about you and your philosophy. Um, for those of you who don't know, Mitch Dalton was the national junior team director, 2013 to 2020, mm, 15 to 20, 15 to 20, um, and you you basically saw him on deck. He he pretty much knew everyone there, um, <laughs> but especially it was always exciting at selection meets. Mitch would have this huge handful of envelopes that he would he would give to each national junior team member that would make the team, and and you always saw this just beam of joy, um, because that was you know that's kind of like you're in like hey you're on the national so junior team so fun yeah that was so fun yeah um, so so uh, I want to talk to you about that position, but first let's let's get a little bit about your swimming background. How did you get into aquatics? Uh, pretty stereotypical tale, I think. Older brother swam. Um, I grew up in Sydney, Australia, and you know it was a time in Sydney when Sydney was growing, and I think my mom and dad saw it was growing pretty fast, and if they didn't keep their boys occupied, they were going to get into some trouble. So uh, they just figured, hey, if they're at some practice all the time, like my mom and dad were both working, um, if they're at practice, I don't have to worry about them. So that's kind of how it started, and then say as I got a little bit older, my brother kind of fell out of love with swimming and I can like specifically remember the practice I beat him at. And then it was like a week later, <laughs> he was done. He was like, I'm over it. Um, but I, I, we moved over to DC area, Potomac Valley when I was like 14 or I was, I was nine. I stayed there till I was about 14. Um, and then I just kind of wasn't really fitting in, in my high school there. And uh, mom and dad thought they'd end up back in Australia. So like, well, why don't you go back to Australia? We'll stay here. So I did boarding school at um, Brisbane Boys College, uh, which is just, it was awesome. It was like college four years earlier um, for all the right reasons. Uh, but um, it was it was cool. I mean, just swimming in Australia is just next level, right? In, in terms of how it's woven into the culture. And I went to the same high school that Kieran Perkins was at. That was also my club team. So I grew up idolizing him and, and uh, just was in awe of him when I would see him. Probably doesn't even know I was alive, but um, that was a really cool experience. Experience and, and swimming for John Carew then was just like amazing and just really started making me see like these legends in our sport, um, which was cool. Uh, and then ultimately came back over to, to the States um, and I was kind of coaching NBSL. So anyone who doesn't know what NBSL is, I mean, I'm biased. I think it's the most competitive summer league in the country. I know everyone says that, but like go spend a Saturday morning on a pool deck in Northern Virginia and you'll figure it out pretty quick. Um, but I was coaching there and, and our coach said like, Hey, are you going to walk on when you go to James Madison? And I said, walk on to what? Like, you, am I going to drive? Like, I didn't even know what he meant by walk on. And uh, he kind of told me, Hey, they have a team. Like you can walk on. So I did that. Loved it there. Went through a couple great coaches with uh, Matt Barney and uh, Chris Feaster, who's now out of the sport. Just loved my experience there. Uh, I actually went through the pretty uncomfortable process of our team got cut my senior year. So uh, September, uh, my senior year, they announced it was going to be our last season. So that was pretty devastating and certainly kind of makes what's happening now a little more real every day when I see it. Um, but then from there, yeah, decided to stay back and coach the women's team for, the, uh, for my fifth year, which was awesome. Um, Sam Smith, or now Barony, uh, and, and Dane Peterson, who's the head coach there now, was the assistant his first year. That was just awesome. I mean, I, I was such a jerk. I was such a dork in college, and I was just in my own space, and I, I wasn't the best teammate. And, um, you know, working with the women that year taught me, uh, A, how to coach women, B, how to be a better coach, be a better teammate. It was, it was just awesome. So from there, I went to GW, um, was there for about two years. And then got the gig up at Princeton with Rob Orr and just loved my time there. It, it changed me fundamentally as a person. Um, and then uh, just knew I, it was time for a new challenge. And um, there's a bit of a backstory behind how I got this job here. But 
uh, sort of took a, a, bought a one way ticket out to California and said, don't come home until you know your next move. Um, so I, I would usually go out and kind of shadow Salo. I'd try to get up and see Durden or Terry and, and Cal around the Santa Clara meet. And I was like, all right, just beg him to be their volunteer and then sleep on couches, work at Starbucks, whatever. It's an Olympic year in 2015. Like you'll figure it out. One by one, they're all like, I got my guy or gal. Like, so I was sitting in the hospitality room um, at Santa Clara and uh, uh, a former USA swimming uh, uh, like operations games management person. Her name is Margo. I knew her from Princeton. She said like, what are you, are you going to be at Princeton forever? And I kind of told her this, like Greg Meehan had just told me like, oh, I just hired someone, man. So I was like walking there all deflated. And um, I was telling her this, like kind of bleeding my heart. And Margo just had this like, stoic face and was like interesting and then like walked away and I was like come on lady <laughs> put my heart out to you um but we were at whatever that theme park is in in Santa Clara is it like Adventureland or Adventure World or the one on the whatever beach? that no. uh no I think it's like a Six Flags or something but okay. I was in the, the line for the log flume with um a Princeton swimmer Lisa Boyce and I get this email from her and she's like hey I recommended you for this job you're going to get a call from Frank Bush and I was like wait, what's the job? And she's like, uh, junior team director. And I was like, what? Like uh, had no, it wasn't, I didn't even know Jack was leaving. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't have a suit and Frank called me up. He's like, I don't know who you are. What's your deal. You got 15 minutes. And I was like, damn. Um, so we started talking, went well, yeah, bought a suit on the road. And he said, when can we get you out here? And I said, buy me a ticket home and whenever you want. So, um, on my way home, he called me up in the, the uh, Dallas airport and offered me the job and kind of the rest is history. Wow. Okay, hold on. So many questions. So first yeah. of all, if you have 15 minutes to explain yourself to Frank Bush, you know, the kids, this is prime interview material right here. What, mm. what do you say? Uh, the best advice I ever got for interviews is ask the person about themselves. Get them talking to you themselves so i'm guessing i did that i don't even remember i was staying at this um bed and breakfast in berkeley uh at the time because i'd like gone out to try to watch uh the cow team a little bit and just kind of learn from them and it was this one of those places that looks better on yelp than it is in person you know and uh you could hear people through the walls and i was just like where am i right now i had no idea of what what my next week was going to look like um but i was just like super intimidated to talk to him and Frank has this way of um, having these like silent spaces when he, like after you finish talking. And I just remember being like, do I fill this space? Do I let him talk? Like, what do I do? I, I thought I did terrible, but I guess I did. Okay. So well, I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then you go out to meet him in Colorado Springs. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I fly out to Colorado. I think it was like the Tuesday after Santa Clara. Um, and I remember, like, you used to, they've changed the offices at USA Swimming. Now it's like kind of like Google when you're in there. But at the time, there were like all these cubicles that had these little narrow hallways. And I remember walking up the staircase and looking down to the left. And I could see all the way at the end, Frank was there with his hands in his pocket. And then behind him was this huge photo of Michael Phelps in Beijing sitting next to Kavik. And I was like, you do not belong here, man. Like, what are you doing? Um, but it was great. I mean, he, for people that don't know Frank, I mean, for, for everything that he's accomplished in the sport, he's just the most humble person and, and we still talk and, and, uh, he's just, he's kind of like a second dad to me. He's obviously a mentor, um, just a really positive person. And it became pretty apparent us talking in his office that nothing I could say in terms of like, what I did as a coach um, or how I was as a recruiter or anything like that was going to matter. It was about who he thought I was as a person. And I, I still call him up all the time. And I'm like, man, I don't, I was the dumbest hire on paper. Like if you look at all these club coaches he could have hired, right. That I'll have all these big names that have accomplished stuff. I made no sense. Um, and uh, I still ask him like, why did you hire me? And the only, the closest he's ever given me an answer is like, I'm starting to see why now. Uh, um, but he's never given me a full answer, but I think that's something that I've learned from him is, you know, when it's time to make hires or, or in, in the case of in the junior team, put someone on staff, um, look for potential and coach them up, uh, more than like, look for someone that's established and just 
let them keep being established. There, there's room for both of those, but I think too often we try to go for someone that's that's a name or we want we want some stability or credibility in, in with them and we bank all them in that and then it's like, hey, let's let's look for capacity of people instead of just like what they've already done. So then you get the job. Um, take me through your first year as oh. director of the junior national team. Yeah. Um, I mean, at that when, when you started, when you were hired, did you really even know what the position would be? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a few junior teamers at Princeton, so I, I had a fair idea of like what the program was. Um, and uh, I had a, a buddy that worked at USA Swimming, uh, Josh Fowler. So he was kind of helping with some things and, so I, I had a fair idea, um, but really the junior team was Jack Roach, you know? And I was like, I can't be this guy. This guy's amazing. Like how am I going to ever fill his shoes? And it, you know, you're kind of like a little bit screwed when you meet everybody for the first time and they're like, you've got big shoes to fill. And it's like, yeah, I know, dude, like you don't have to keep telling me that. Um, but I remember my first trip in, in Singapore which was like my third week on the job, which when you think about it, it's kind of crazy. Um, I just kind of like thrown into the, the lines down there. But at the end of the trip, I mean, Jack and I always joke, like it was the worst leadership ever. Um, I hope those kids had a good experience. I think they did, but he thought I was in charge. I thought he was in charge. So we both just kind of <laughs> took a step back. Um, uh, but he sat down with me on the bus one day after like the last session. And he's like, how are you doing? And it was our first real like, Hey, I see you kind of call and, or talk. And he said, whatever you do, Mitch, do it your way. And that was like such a relief for me to hear from him that he wasn't, he didn't have this thing about the junior team that it had to be held on to in a certain way. It, um, that just sort of gave me permission to, to do things the way I wanted. And, and I didn't know yet. So my saving grace the first year was, was just these amazing club coaches. I just kind of went to them and I was like, yo, I'm a 31 year old assistant college coach. Like this is your world. Teach me it. Um, and we kind of put this task force together and I just tried to ask as many questions as I could to hear anecdotally from, from people, what helps them make Olympians um, or develop Olympians. Um, I pretty much realized there's no one way to do this. So I can't program for one way to do it, but just sort of thought like, what's the one thing I can do. And that was create vision. And I think it had always sort of been, intrinsically known what the junior team was but there wasn't language behind it and I really believe in the power of like the written word or language so um, I think that was the biggest thing we did the first year was just put language to it and make a vision statement that the, the vision of the national junior team is to increase the future performance of the United States Olympic team boom and um, you know everything we have to do moving forward whether it was like selection um, resources was all is that going to help with that vision um, so that was, that was the first year. It was pretty rough. I didn't have a social circle that first year. I'd kind of made up this stupid rule, like, don't be friends with your coworkers, like have your own life. Um, and then I found out, oh, I work so much. I don't have any friends. So, um, but, you know, through meeting people uh, at USA Swimming, Morgan Weinberg, Russell Mark, um, Kara Rainey, a few others that have, that have uh, now departed, we kind of had our little squad and that, that really helped me um, kind of feel good in Colorado. But that first year, like the, the night I got hired at Texas, I, I called about 35 coaches and just said like, thank you. Because um, on paper I had, like I said, it, it, was, it, it seemed like a, a stupid hire. I had no idea what I was getting into really or what the intricacies of that. I'd never developed an Olympian from a club team. And I mean, people like Allison BB, Dan Flack, Chuck Batchelor, Bruce Gemmel, Tim Bauer. Uh, I mean, I could just sit here and just like name that whole list, but they taught me what it means to be part of the swimming community and what it means to be part of the national team community. And, and to be honest, if it wasn't for them, I probably would have done that gig for like two years and bounced and I don't know, work somewhere where I want to live in any field. But um, working with those club coaches really made me fall in love with the swimming community in a way that I'm, I'm just so grateful for, for the time they gave me. Yeah. So, so with that, you know, you, you said you kind of had your mission statement, um, you were asking a lot of questions. Um, you know, something I've wondered ever since I've been aware of this position is, is like, what it, what is it? What do you do? Like, are you a coach or are you, um, you know, like a manager, like hat? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you wear a lot of different hats in this role, but you know, for you, what are some of the prime 
responsibilities of uh, of directing the national junior team. Yeah. Everyone would always ask me, like, what do you do when you're not on trips? Like, mm -hmm. do you just, like, hang out all day? And, um, you know, year one was, like, what are we doing? And how are we doing it? That was year one. So it was, like, a lot of time on the phone, visiting clubs and, and like, breaking bread with people so they'd open up a little bit about, like, how USA Swimming could be better, how I could help them. Um, and then I would say year two, I started feeling like, I mean, I would travel to meets, but I started feeling like, okay, we've had everything set up. We've got to let it run now. But then I just felt like I need to do more. Like I'm, I'm waiting for this to happen. I need to like put it in front of people more. So towards the end of year two or three, you know, we have like amazing people in the national team. Like I said, like Russell and, and, um, Katie Arnold, Matt Barbini and, and Dan McCarthy and, and now Keenan that work so much with like our blue chip recruits. Um, they're just like so scheduled out with the, with the national team. I said recruits, I'm already in Texas talk with our, our blue chip, uh, um, you know, Olympians and medalists yep. that I realized pretty quickly, like you need to move to a performance role more than probably this job description has. So I would say towards the last couple of years, last year or so years, it was, um, you know, I'd start every season by calling everyone on the junior team, calling their coaches. And we do sort of like a, a state of the athlete, like my take on state of the union, you know, like what's your, where's this athlete at? What's, what's your story? What's your journey together? Um, the, the hardest question to answer is like, how can we help you? It's like, whoa, it's so overwhelming. So I had some different areas that I would kind of check in with them on things. And, um, but so that, that sort of became where I would plan my season, where I would travel, uh, based on those conversations. Um, you know, there are people like Chris Plum who, I went to Kama once, like he good, like he don't need my help, you know? Um, maybe we, we check in a couple of times. Um, but then there's, you know, it's so hard and club coaches don't get enough credit for like balancing a stud and a program. Oof. When you got parents involved in stuff, that is so hard. So, I mean, there's times where I would visit people and I would just go and, um, work with their one person so that they could, uh, be a little more free with the club or vice versa. I would help them coach the club and they could work with that one person. Um, and then do some talks with the club just so people understood, like we all benefit by having someone that's good in our program. Um, so I'd say the last couple of years, it became a lot more of like traveling, coaching, um, sort of working on performance stuff. Obviously when Luca came up, uh, Billy couldn't be there for five weeks. So like, that's a, that was sort of like my last experience there. Uh, but the closer we got to the games, the more I just sort of said like, you know what, it doesn't matter what this job was when I started out, like it, you need to be what you need to be right now for people. So, um, it's hard. I mean, there was, it went from 110 people to 60 people on the junior team or 40 people, um, per gender, uh, used about 65 once we put all the selection stuff in with open water and I still wasn't seeing everybody. There's still people you could probably call up and be like, Mitch did nothing for me. Um, but you know, it's trying to learn how to use your time. And, and, um, I don't think there's anything, I mean, people might, might second guess me on this, but, I don't think there's anything I ever did that really, I would say, changed anybody's trajectory. I was just helping that coach reinforce the good work they were already doing. Um, so that was kind of a day to day. Sometimes it was just problem solving, season planning. People would call me up for advice. I would love the nitty gritty of like, like working with Ken and Carson, right? On, on, hey, here's your trial schedule. You have a million events. Where are you going to go? Here's, you know, getting the NBC timeline, you've got 13 minutes here. It's going to take two and a half minutes to walk to the warm down pool. What do you need to eat? Like that stuff, I nerd out on it. It's so fun. Um, so, yeah, I think I just became whatever people kind of in my space needed. Yeah. All right. So, so last question before we get into uh, our, our second part of this interview, yeah. um, you know, you're in Austin now we're, we're mere miles apart as we speak. Um, you know, what, what drove you to, to, to leave this position to come here? Um, and, and what are you looking forward to about getting back into the full-time coaching game? Yeah, it's funny when people, um, like I vividly remember having this conversation with Chris Webb at the OTC and he's like, would you ever go back to college coaching? I'm like, no way, man. Like I'm going <laughs> to coach club. Like I want to be like you guys, like mm -hmm. this community of like athletes that are young and developing and, and parents. Like I just love that vibe. And it, there's so much teaching at that age and man, that's powerful. Um, and he's like, all right, well, what would it take for you to get back to college coaching? And I was like, 
All right, has to kind of be. <laughs> well, I was a big part of it, right? Like, <laughs> I, I would say that uh, it had to be this perfect Venn diagram of um, like what fell in the middle of. It had to be a town I wanted to live in because I've kind of always moved for swimming. Um, and I said, like, this next move is going to be for me. Like, I'm 36. Like, live where you want to live, man. Um, so that was one where I wanted to live. And the other was, you know, after working at Princeton, like it had to be an academic institution that I respected as an academic institution. Like I couldn't go to, I probably shouldn't say university, but I'm not going to go coach at DeVry, right? Like, sorry to all our swimmers out there that go to DeVry, but, uh, like I'm not going to do that for an undergrad experience kind of thing. So, um, it had to be an academic institution in a town I lived in. And then someone said, so you want to be a head coach? I was like, well, I'd be an assistant, but it's gotta be someone that I really respect and want to work for. So there's probably like four or five schools initially. And then you add that. And, um, the people that I could really think I could work for probably came down to three. Um, and, uh, Carol, I was talking to Carol, like shortly after she made a, a staffing change with Rorick and I, I knew how much she loved and respected Rorick and it had to be hard for her to make that change and just called her to see how she was doing. And she's like, well, you're on my short list. And I was like, Oh God, what did I do? Like, you know, usually when you're on someone's list, it's bad. And, and she said, yeah, man, like, let's talk about it. And I was like, Carol, pff, not, not leaving USA swimming. We got to try to figure out this Olympic situation, all that. And, um, yeah, we just, we just started talking more and more and we, we didn't start talking X's and O's initially. It was more about like, what do we want this sport to be? Like, what is, what is, what do we want this national team community to look like? Like how should a program be, be, um, contributing to that? And, um, just really big high level stuff about, about those things, about um, just our values. And uh, I would say the call that really got me is I was like, all right, you got to give me the vision, like put it in words. What are you trying to accomplish there? Cause I'm not, I'm not just going to leave here just cause you're cool and we're, we're jiving. Um, and she <laughs> kind of laid out that vision and, and we, I was like, that's it. Boom. Like she goes, you got to hold me to it. And I was like, you can guarantee I'm going to do that. So um, there's not many people I would, I would pack up my life and, and uh, my pooch, who's by my feet here to, to um, make a big life change, but she's, she's for sure one of them. So, yeah, and that's before I even got here and really realized, like, how awesome Texas is as, like, an athletic department and stuff like that. So that's only reinforced it. But uh, Carol was a huge part of this move for me and the opportunity to, to, you know, contribute to the national team and stay on that, like, Olympic track is just, uh, just so exciting. That's awesome. Uh, congrats. Thank you. Um, I'm super excited to have you down here. Uh, I, I, and I'm really excited to see what you guys are able to accomplish uh, for the Texas women's. Yeah, me too. I think once we, once we get back rolling, it'll be, uh, it's going to be good. We're excited. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Enough chit chat. <laughs> yeah. Let's get into it. We, Mitch and I spent several emails worth of conversations <laughs> developing this game for you, you listeners and viewers. For the uh, people. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's, I, I think we'll, we'll call it truth or tweet, spill your guts, or tweet your guts. I don't know. All those are good. Call it. All those are good. All those are good. Based on the James Cordon game, spill your guts or fill your guts. We don't have gross food to eat, but here's how it's going to go. Mitch and I are going to trade questions and we can either choose to answer that question truthfully, or we can pick an answer from one of these hats and tweet it. And uh, well, I guess they're not answers to the questions. They're just silly things that we would probably never tweet uh, otherwise. <clears throat> that are just probably going to poke the bear of the swimming community on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. The, these will serve as a, uh, our comments on swim swim for today. <laughs> right. There we go. All right. Um, so Mitch, I'm going to, um, I'll get things started. Uh, yeah. I'm going to ask you the first question since we're already on the topic of the national junior team. Uh, question number one, you worked with so many talented and hardworking athletes during your time with the national junior team. Who was the most difficult athlete to manage? Mm. man okay this one this answer is good because it's positive that could have been a very <laughs> negative uh they were all so awesome i mean even when people were having bad days you just kind of 
get to know them, you can have some empathy and they like, boom, feel a part of it and they rock on and just motivate you. But I mean, I'm going to say Michael Andrew and, and this is all a positive thing. Okay. Um, I mean, 2015, we start in Singapore, homeboys doing like seven events because the way our selection procedures were written, if he wanted to do the 50s and stroke, he had to do the hundreds. So he couldn't scratch the hundreds <laughs> and it's Michael. So he's not going to like, he's not going to like ease through the hundreds or like dog it. Um, he's going to go all out. He wants to win, you know? So that guy was just tired. And, uh, but it, you know, between managing, I think, um, like event schedules, the specificity of his training. Um, and then also like for a junior, we needed like media control around him. We didn't have it cause it was a junior team trip. So I'd have to like stop people from signing autographs cause it was just getting out of hand and stuff. So, but I also learned so much from, from Peter, Michael, I mean, honestly, Tina and Michaela too, like um, just getting to know them and, and uh, seeing things from a different, a different view than I'd probably seen swimming before. I, I, I don't know what their view was of USA swimming before I got there. I think they'd had a couple bad interactions, not with like Jack or anything, just I think what they perceived as USA swimming. Um, and then I kind of went out there in Kansas in 2015 and sat at their home and we got to know each other. And I was just like, these are, I told them I'd misjudged them. I was like, what is this 14 year old going pro? Like, what, what is this? Um, and I kind of misjudged that situation and, and told them that. And once you get to know them, they're just good people doing things for the right reasons. And they're just doing things differently, but they're kicking ass doing it. So why are we hating on them? Um, so I just learned a lot from, from him, but it, it was tough. I mean, like in Indy, Oof, man, like going through the amount of like back hallways that I discovered in the Nat from like trying to get Michael from like a, a warm down pool to a racing pool. And um, it was fun. It was really fun though. It was difficult, but like the challenge was so awesome. That, that is such a great answer. You took that answer in a, in a direction. I didn't think that, that that question would be taken, but I love it. We're big, we just talked to Michael earlier this week. We're big fans. I've, I've been out to his home in California. I mean, just salt of the earth family through and through. They're really great. He's awesome. Yeah. He's awesome. All right. <laughs> Hit me. All right. My turn, shot, right? Mitch. Okay. I'm going to give you like a pretty easy one to start with because my last two are. Just throw me a softball. If, if answered or, if are pretty good. Know. So, um, <laughs> all right. If at this point in time you could change the name of practice and pancakes, right? Like you could revolve the show around something other than pancakes. Yeah. A, a, do you want to do it? And I guess like part of that question is what would it be if you do want to do it? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> is he going to break with the brand? I, <laughs> I don't know if I can answer this because I don't know. Um, what? Is he going to Twitter? Someone. <laughs> I might have to go to Twitter because uh, I think – I'm going to, I'm going to say it and this might kill my brand, but I like pancakes aren't my favorite food. Ladies and gentlemen, we heard it here first. <laughs> and that's not sacrilege because, uh, the whole idea of practicing pancakes is, is to, is to, you know, eat breakfast and watch workouts, but you can't call it breakfast and workouts. Cause that sounds, yeah, weird. that's and, true. Uh, I think practice and pancakes has evolved so so uh so well and i i like what it's become so i don't i don't want to change it i'm going to twitter <laughs> do it <laughs> all right all right do you pull it out or do i pull one out um oh that's a good question how about you pull one out all right here we go i got my my hat here for missy franklin by the way thank you missy and hayes all right let's see here so you have to tweet the following. All right. Oh, this is a good one. Open water should be the primary stepping stone to elite sprinting. Hear me out. <laughs> Ron Aiken is gonna Ron Aiken is gonna retweet this thing like nothing else. Stepping stone. <laughs> it's sprinting. I'm gonna check hear you here. Me out. <laughs> Tweeted. <laughs> yes, dude. Love it. All right, you're up. That was a good one. <clears throat> okay. Question number two. Ooh, okay. I'm uh, in the in the that uh, we're sticking with the food themes. 
Uh, number two. So this game is based, as we explained, on Spill Your Guts or Fill Your Guts, as seen on James Cordone's YouTube channel. What's the worst meal you've seen someone eat on a national junior team trip? Not the worst meal you've eaten, but the worst mm. meal you have seen a junior eat <laughs> while on a trip. Uh, okay, I can think of one, but I'm probably going to go to Twitter because this is – they eat, like, really well on these trips. Uh, and, like, especially now we travel with these, like, nutritionists and stuff. Uh-huh. But I, I do remember a time in Indy at the JW. Lovely establishment. Very much covered my Marriott points. I don't want to throw shade towards the Marriott. But um, we'd had like chicken for like four nights in a row. And Lucy Norman comes up to me. Like I, I think she got back late after a relay. And she's like sitting there eating. And uh, she calls me over. She's like, hey, do you think this is like cooked or is it just like rare? or just like medium or something. And first of all, there was only half of the chicken breast left. So like whatever I told her, I was like, eh. and it was definitely like just raw in the middle. Um, so the idea of eating raw chicken, it's gotta be up there, but nothing too like, nothing too terrible. So I'll, I'll go to Twitter, because that's a pretty lame answer. Kieran Smith is the best eater ever. Like we would best go to these, Mar- yeah, we would go to these Marinostrums and we'd be in like the South of France and he'd be like, you know, breakfast getting these little, like uh, little pieces of bread and baguette with like different kinds of cheese and like all these awesome things. Or we'd go to a restaurant in Barcelona and like we'd get paella and then he'd like order off the menu and just like the most cultured kid I've ever met at 17 years old, like just knew about the world. And he was late to his first junior team trip because he was like performing the cello. Just like this kid is so interesting and he's awesome. So I, All right, what, we, what am I tweeting? Uh, that's great. Hey, kids, if you want to go 406 in the 500-yard freestyle, yeah. uh, have, have expensive tastes. <laughs> yeah, he's got it. All right. Mitch is tw- – oh, yeah. <clears throat> Mitch is going to tweet, I'd rather have dinner with Beyonce than win a gold medal. Oh, this medal. is perfect. Okay. <laughs> then what? I'd rather have dinner with Beyonce than what? Than win a gold medal. Let's see. Let's go. Win a gold medal at the Olympics. Then win a gold medal at the Olympics. Okay. Gold. Which? Should I yeah. tag Beyonce? I probably should, right? Because she might I mean, retweet it, it. You don't it know. It can't hurt. <laughs> you, yeah. It can't hurt. Which, you know, for, for a normal human being, I'm guessing they're like, well, duh. But for swimmers, that might be a little contra, you know. It's like, I could lose. I might lose some recruits in this, <laughs> Coleman. You better get this interview up quick so people know why I'm typing this. <laughs> Like, Beyonce is cool, but, um, huh. Okay. I'd rather have dinner with Beyonce than win a gold medal at the Olympics, right? Yes. Oof. This is a tough one. <laughs> I mean, oh, all right. I'd rather have dinner with Beyonce than win. All right. There it is. Boom. It's going up. <laughs> it's live. All right. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> You heard it here first, folks. All right, you're up now. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, mo- ready. My turn. Okay. Yeah. Um, the most <laughs> cringeworthy comment section you've ever seen on Swim Swim, where you were just reading it and you were like, "Oof!" Like we got to shut this thing down. But obviously, that's not yeah. how it works. Yeah. I mean, we let it be known. We. Uh, I mean, we don't allow hate speech. You know. Um, but. Let's see. So uh, I'll throw, I, I've got, now that I'm thinking about it, I've got a few. <clears throat> um, first of all, when Mel, it's it last July, 2019, it was June maybe, we did a gold medal minute of, on Simone and it was like the world championship preview. <clears throat> and I, it, whoever's listening to this here you go uh, i write the gold medal minute scripts <laughs> he does not i do he says what i say <laughs> and uh and so i was like he always makes predictions at the end and i was like simone's gonna win the 100 and the 50 he was like okay yeah and so he said it and uh some of our commenters were not very happy about that 
And listen, she's got great really? competition. Sarah Showstrom, world record holder in both events. Kate Campbell, you know, there's a lot of great female sprinters. But I was like, I think that's what's going to happen. Lo and behold, that's what happened. So, yeah, <laughs> called it. I mean, you can't you can't bet against that lady. It's it's <laughs> I I wouldn't. Um, yeah, but but we got some, yeah people people uh, thought that, that 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 was blasphemy. And so I didn't like that comment section. Wait, um, do you think it was coming? Do you guys know where they're coming from? Like, do you know if it's from America or overseas? I don't. That's a good question. But because uh, if you're an American and you're not rooting for Simone, get out of my way. Like, I don't have time for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, guys. Let's see. I'm. I'll. I'll go to this comment section and I'll pick a few of my favorites. Here, here we go. The first comment on this section, and then, and then I'll move on to a different question. <laughs> I could maybe, maybe see her gutting out <laughs> a win in the hundred. Campbell might blow it, although she seems much better than in the past, and not sure Showstrom will match her fifty-one-seven. No way I see her in the fifty, though. She's behind Showstrom, Bloom, and Campbell for sure. Maybe not all of them, but at least one. She may go to for sure. Eight. <laughs> but that will be, but that will not be fast enough to win. Uh, that had 17 likes, two dislikes, and was it had two good. dislikes? <laughs> yeah, that's I all mean, right, kids. This is a lesson right now why swim, swim like comments aren't a crystal ball. Like, you don't need to be looking at them before meet. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, another, another comment Campbell and Showstrom hyphen. Manuel's time has passed. That's the comment. So <clears throat> I didn't like that one. There um, should be some kind of rule where if someone makes a bold prediction like that, they can stay anonymous until it happens. And then they either look like they're super smart or they just get red to fill. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, I agree. And I, so I think the other one, my, my worst one was, uh, which is a reoccurring one, is uh joe schooling when he went when when dressel went 50.8 at uh 2017 world champ trials and then a few weeks later you know schooling posted a video or there was a video surfaced of schooling going 50.7 in practice i think and people hated that and uh, and people still like reference that, <laughs> and 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 people still have throw shade at him for that to this day, which I think is it's like ridiculous because if people, you know, obviously I'm biased because I'm in the media. If people did that more, swimming would have get way more popular. People would be way more into it. And I think mm. you just you'd have more competition. We might have to start doing that now, anyway. No, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Swim beats. It's like, wh like, what is the harm in 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 a good natured challenge to one of your friends? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. get it, and I, I, I'm bitter about those comments to this day. <laughs> yeah. Me, every time they make me cringe. But I, don't I feel like there's a part of me that, like, before I got to say swimming, where I, I was like, I easily jumped on the hate, hater bandwagon, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, saying something when I first got to USA Swimming, and Russell was like, Russell Mark goes, dude, don't be a hater. Are you a hater? And I was like, I don't want to be a hater. And, like, it totally changed the way I would talk about stuff. It's like, I don't want to be a hater. So... I don't want to be a hater, man. No, no way. <laughs> um, all right. All right. Best comment section. Uh, or I guess worst comment sections. All right. Last question for you, Mitch. You were a mentor and a leader for a long time. I guess you're still those things, but. Um, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> to, to, to this day, what is the, <laughs> what is the most awkward question you have ever asked <laughs> and by who so that's two questions you don't have to answer okay. either but you could answer one or both uh was there a time when you were just asked an extremely awkward question um i'm, I'm assuming you were around a lot of teenagers on the national junior team trip and you know they're they're coming of age they have 
<laughs> they have some very insightful questions and they have some non insightful questions. Oh man, there's probably a hilarious answer to this that probably most likely involves like James Jones. He's just the king of just <laughs> what dude. And like, everyone's just laughing. Um, I might have to tweet again just because I can't think of anything. I mean, this is an awkward one. Okay, I'll give an answer. Okay. It wasn't in front of a lot of people. So this kind of relates to your last question or my last question with the comment section. Yeah. Being on a staff that decides relays is not a fun process. Oh. It is not a fun process. And I can guarantee you if you've thought about something and put it in that comment section, like we've been thinking about it for a couple of weeks now based on things we've seen. You're not so, that original. Like, <laughs> right. Like, and, and, and Russell's made a 50 page packet on everyone's <laughs> splits ever um, in short course and long course and short course meters. Like there's not a piece of data we don't go over. So that's one part, right? Like making the decision is hard. Yeah. The second part that you have to nail or it just ruins everything is the communication to the athletes. And that evolved as I was at USA Swimming and we got better and better and better at it. And um, this happened in Indy, actually. We were so good at it. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, we always had the advantage of like learning what went wrong at Worlds and then like cleaning it up and making it better for World Juniors. Yep. So I was always lucky in that sense. But, you know, Bruce Gemmel and, and Kate Lunson were our, our head coaches. Um, and they were, we were from the beginning, like talking about relays, we're like, we we cannot mess this up. Like we have to make sure that an athlete knows anyone who even thinks they're like a candidate. Cause we tell them everyone's a candidate for relay. Um, anyone who might even have a reasonable assumption that they should be on that relay. Like we have to tell them before the team knows um, who's roommates with who. So that someone doesn't just like walk in a room and be like, I'm on the relay. And they be like, that means I'm not. Yep. Um, and then in Indy, so we, we leave that circle, right? And it's sort of like the, hey, whatever happens in this relay, like this is our decision, whether we were advocating for it or not. Everyone looks at each other in the eye. We all say our piece. And then we, we, before we leave that circle, we're like, who's going to talk to each person? So each coach is talking to a person, an athlete face-to-face. -face. Um, and I was like, man, we're crushing this. And I'm like, um, walking back with Chris Plum. Like I think Drew got left off a relay or something. And I'm like, trying to, Hey, like Chris, are we good? You know? And I'm like walking back with him and Chris is like, no, nah, man, we, we did that the right way. Like I said my piece. So I'm walking back like, dude, you are crushing leadership. This is awesome. <laughs> and, um, I just like happened to go do the rounds at, uh, at the hotel. And, um, like I kind of popped my head past the door, uh, of where like Cody Bobby was in, in the, for the four medley relay. And, uh, I guess, I was sitting downstairs telling Bruce Gemmel, like, hey, did anybody tell Nick Albiero that he's not on this relay? And he's like, no. And I was like, it's okay. I got it. It's only been like 10 minutes since we told Cody. Like, I think we're good. Yeah. So, like, I go upstairs and I just kind of, like, check on Cody. And Nick's sitting in there with his Norma Tech on both legs. So, he can't go anywhere. And Cody had just told him. And Nick's like, hey, I, I guess I'm not on the relay. So, that's kind of a question. But I was just like oh buddy like i'm so sorry like and nick's is a stand-up guy like he got it he was obviously bummed but uh that was so awkward because it was like cody standing there <laughs> nick sitting there and not being able to move i couldn't be like hey nick come out in the hallway let's talk real quick yeah he was just like sitting there and i was like oh um but uh yeah that was super awkward and not great so yeah i yeah i i don't think i've really ever had uh to to <laughs> to have a situation like that where like, you know, I coach club for a long time. So, and in that scenario, you know, kids kind of know where they're going to fall in terms of relays for the most part mm -hmm. on the club I coach at least. And so I'm not envious of, <laughs> of being in that position. Yeah. It, it, it was tough. I, I mean, I always thought about it this way. One of my favorite parts about the job was going out to a club coach and saying, Hey, I'd like, I'd like you to be on this uh, staff here and help represent the United States of America. That was just like, like, like you mentioned the athletes before. That's so fun. Cause they don't know any better. Like these guys and gals, like they know it, they know what it means. Um, so I always thought like you get to do that. You have to deal with this. Right. So like any of the really tough ones, 
I didn't think that was ever a coach's burden. I was like, let me, I'll, you don't need to be a bad guy. Like you just need to yeah. coach. I'm like, I'll, I'll take that. So I always thought that was like, like the, the balancing of the energy, you know? So yeah, yeah it, it, it comes with the territory, but uh, um, yeah. That seems like, a good, so, it seems like a good way to think about it. All right. Um, you're up, man. So most painful interview you have ever, I'm going to say like you've been a part of, not that you've seen, because you could easily get out of this and be like, Iverson, you know, we're talking about practice, like yeah. on a technicality, you could get out of this. I want to be clear, most painful interview you've been a part of. Oh, yes, I have a, my, <laughs> I, I didn't ask this question, so I have no shame in, in, uh, <clears throat> in, t- in talking about it. So I won't say names. <clears throat> um, but uh, we had Phelps in, in the media scrum. It was some, it was a meet in 2014. I want to say Santa Clara. Maybe 2014, 2015. It was certainly before San Antonio 2015 Nationals when he mm. went off. Right. Just so, a cool. That was my first meet, like as part of USA Swimming. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it was all, like we're sitting on the stage. I'm selecting the like World Junior Team, and I don't remember what the two I am was. I think the hundred fly was first, right? Like after Leclerc was talking smack. It was the two it, fly when he went two fly. And then we yeah. talk smack and then it was the hundred fly. <laughs> oh my God. So I was like sitting on that stage. I'm like, this is the best seat in the house. <laughs> that place was packed. I was like, welcome to USA. So yeah, that's awesome. Anyway, keep going. Dude, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that meets historic. I'll never forget it. it I, yeah. But so it was before that meet, um, he had, I, you know, he hadn't gone below a 51 in the hundred fly. <clears throat> And he was still coming back and his comeback, you know, it, it, was, it was, I think before that point, you know, everyone was kind of like, oh, where's he at? I don't want to say shaky, but everyone's just kind of like, what's, what's he really going to do here? And uh, so he, the, the media is talking to him and someone. <laughs> I'm already cringing, by the way. Like, <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone asked him. <clears throat> so they're talking about the hunter fly and someone asked him. So do you think, <laughs> Do you, do you think 50, going a 50 point in the 100 fly is, is really realistic? <laughs> they asked Michael Phelps <laughs> if him going 50, not even 49, which is his best time. They asked him if going 50 point anything is realistic. <laughs> I'll never oh, what did he like, say? Did he just walk away? Did he just walk away? I could see him just being like, <laughs> get out of here. He like he did the he did the verbal equivalent of walking away like so he he like <laughs> you could see his eyes get wide and he just stared at them for a second and then he was, his 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 only words to that question were anything's possible anything's possible and then just like next question <laughs> Damn. I, like yeah I I remember being you know uh, next to this reporter and just thinking like what <laughs> like were they a swimming reporter or were they from like you know a different organization i i'm not gonna say <laughs> yeah okay oh okay um <laughs> i'm not gonna divulge details but the interview's out there somewhere um but mm. it was just i like <laughs> you know it's like i know we haven't seen him swim like super fast but like, jesus come on man <laughs> That, you know what that's like? That's like when people ask Serena, do you think you can like win another major? <laughs> yeah. Like, don't go there, man. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh. I mean, right. It's, yeah. This, so that, that I, I was like, oh, God. That, mm. that was certainly my most memorable and cringe interview I've been a part of. That's a good one. That's a good one. <clears throat> um. Well, Mitch, it's been a blast talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll get this out uh, soon enough so that people aren't wondering about our ridiculous tweets. Okay, wait. Swim Swim just quoted it. I just got a <laughs> notification. Was that you? That wasn't me. I swear. I don't. I don't mess with our Twitter. It was not me. Uh, I think. I think our. Um, Dude, you got to get this interview up quick. Cause... <laughs> okay, listen to this. Swim Swim just quoted the tweet and said hot take. Uh, oh, I see that now, yeah. Simon uh, Lamar just quoted it and said, Mitch, say it's not true. Dan Flack just DM'd me and said, dude. Alex <laughs> Braunfeld just said, is this true? 
<laughs> oh wow, you've got a you've got a hot a pop in Twitter. <laughs> Somebody um, else tweeted and just said no. All right, I might have to make an edit. Like, can I have some permission to edit something here? I won't say like why. I'll let it go for another ten minutes. Ten, I think that's fair. Ten minutes, right. and then you can uh, oh, and then you can reveal yourself to the world. We don't want to ruin any careers here. You just uh, Carol's gonna kill me. All right. <laughs> Uh, Mitch, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, man. All <laughs> right. Have a good one. Peace. You've been listening to the Swim Swam Podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.